Right, so last week we were speaking to Temba and one of the things he raised was economic growth in order to see the South Africa we want. Joining me is Rudy Dix from the presidency. Rudy, thank you so much for your time thank this you. afternoon. Thank you for inviting me along. So we've been hearing about this dream of 5% economic growth in South Africa and how that would really change the trajectory of the country. Is that actually possible considering we're sitting at less than 1% now? Definitely is, um, but it's going to take a lot of hard work. Um, a lot of long-term important measures that we need to take, for example, but they're also short-term stuff because many people can't wait for delivery on the social side, you know, so issues of employment and immediately getting jobs, young people being frustrated. But fundamentally, if we want to have a stable high level of growth, which is 5% and beyond, which the National Development Plan sets out, we're going to have to do a lot of structural hard changes. And what does those structural reforms mean? Those reforms refer to I don't know if you've heard about it, Operation Wulind Lela. Uh, not Wulind Lela from Brenda Fassi, of course, <laughs> but it's also opening up, right? So in our sense, it means <clears throat> opening up the economy. And these structural reforms have beset ourselves for many, many years, and they are fundamental to try and ensure that we allow for business to invest, for the economy to grow, for employment to be created, and that's quite critical. There are five key structural reform challenges that we currently undertaken and addressing. The most important, of course, is that our economy cannot grow if we don't have a stable energy supply or if we do the fundamental reforms that are required to create a, a stable energy supply. Secondly, um, significant reforms have already been done and have been undertaken around the telecommunication sector, auctioning of spectrum, for example, the ability for us to be able to reduce data costs. Those are going to be quite critical, especially for business and for small businesses. Thirdly, water and water supply is going to be quite important, important including pricing. Fourthly, um, big challenges that are currently facing us in both uh, ports and rail logistics, and that's going to be important, especially for big exporters and for those who require to use the um, you know, ports and rail. And lastly, which is um, one of the more important areas, but it's quite critical, is being able to ensure that we get um, the relevant skills. So reforming of the visa regime to get the relevant skills to grow our economy and to attract those, those millions of tourists that are required to come to our country. So those are the five key structural things that we think would boost growth quite significantly. And we've seen some of those benefits already come through. So it's always really good to diagnose the problem and it's good that you have a sound understanding and you're saying to us that these are the challenges that we have and if we deal with these, then we're going to achieve that 5% growth. But how long is this going? Yeah. I mean, the problem is that when we generally talk about structural reform programs, one think about them, oh, these are years ahead, you know? Yeah. They take years. Yeah. We can't wait any longer. South Africa has seen close on to 30 years of democracy and, you know, we still have a relatively high unemployment rate. We see dismal growth. Our investment numbers are not looking all too good. And these are kind of things that you, you want to see quite immediately. Already on some of the reform progress, we've already seen some amazing stuff happening. Let's use energy as an example. Uh, South Africa did not have or allow for um, in, um, gen private in generation. The only way we allowed for generation was uh, self-generation, of course, um, but not selling across the grid to another mm -hmm. customer, or, for example, participating in the independent power producer program, which is the procurement bid window program that everybody commonly knows. About 18 months ago, we introduced changes to the legislation that allowed for uh, generation projects from the private sector, where ESCOM is not the off-taker, but a private sector um, you know, uh, firm is the off-taker, someone that requires the energy and purchases it from the producer of the energy. Today, we have close on to 10 gigawatts of projects that we are tracking. They're obviously at different phases of coming online. Um, that's 10,000 megawatts, um, totaling about 104 projects, totaling a value of about 200 over 200 billion rand. We didn't have that 18 months ago. So that's an important opportunity. You have to build those projects here. You know, that's employment creation, investment, um, uh, capital, capital investment, but it also serves an important pu purpose of providing energy security. Another good example is the spectrum auction, you know, um, and that's quite important for us to be able to sell off, you know, a scarce spectrum that we've had 4G and 5G, you see this. And uh, when we've done that, that was quite important, partly so because we've been, you know, we haven't done that in the last 10 years. And so, you know, selling that off is quite important. And for us, we believe 
that what it does do is going to be able to reduce data costs, it's going to be able to expand telecommunications investment, access for um, you know, low-income households, for rural communities, for women and youth in particular. On the other hand, there are still challenges, and that may take a little bit longer. Um, you, you know that uh, a few weeks ago, uh, Transnet announced its financial results. Um, the situation in ports and rail are fairly dire. Um, you know, commodity bulk exports are not getting to port, the volumes that are required. Um, and these are, this is impacting quite significantly. So we have to think about the structural reform programs that are going to be quite important for addressing that. We are developing a roadmap. So that roadmap for freight logistics, we refer to it, is going to be important. There's two components. The first is shorter measures, so how do we get the volumes up, right? And the second is what are the sort of logistics sector that we want to see in about 5, 10, 15 years' time? So while we address the immediate stuff, we also need to think about where we want to go to. Think of South Africa in the bottom part of the globe, right? You see that circle. We're in the worst possible spot. Uh, if we don't have a competitive logistics space, our competitiveness diminishes because there are significant uh, distances that we have to travel with our goods across, uh, you know, to different ports and stuff like that. So absolutely, I think these are important things that we want to see immediately, but also lay the basis for longer term reforms. I mean, you've spoken about the, the rail logistics, which was a problem because we missed out on commodities, boom, multiple absolutely. commodities booms because of that, and that really affected big industry. But we know that in South Africa, in order to grow our economy, we don't just need those big industries and the miners, small and medium enterprises, the lifeblood of our economy, also really battling with the challenges of uh, not so much logistics, but I would say power as well. Absolutely. How do you integrate them? How do you deal with them? If someone is a small business owner, what are you saying to them to give them confidence that the South Africa they want to see is actually going to turn out to be there. That's so important because you're right, that is the lifeblood, that is where we're going to create the jobs, it's not going to be necessarily in the big firms. And so we need to think about a multitude of different interventions that are there. If I, if I would say some of the big firms that are there, how do we get small business into their value chains, into their supply chains? Mm. That's quite important, right? Because take Anglo, for example. Anglo has, must have, must have uh, you know, um, massive supply chains where they're able to develop, for example, small businesses, create opportunities for them to be able to access international or local markets, and that's going to be important. But while we ask that from the private sector, we also need to do a lot more from our side. What do we, what do we need to do to create an environment for growth of SMMEs or the regulatory changes, red tape, for example, the cost of doing business? These are issues that it's in our control that we can fix and we must yeah. be able to deal with that. Financing, for example, again, do we have sufficient capital or, or um, entrepreneurs trained to be able to uh, uh, deal with the challenges that face them? And then also thirdly, you know, don't you think we need to also develop our education system, both basic and post-school education system, to develop a, 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 you know, a culture of entrepreneurship? Um, so we move away from the fact that everybody that leaves school thinks about work and employment, but what about earning opportunities? Isn't it more important for us to be able to think about that? And we create this, um, this kind of market that talks about people that want to move into labor market and to jobs, but also those that we can nourish, those that we can develop into entrepreneurs. And that's the kind of importance for us in society here in South Africa, that we develop that kind of skill, that kind of opportunity for mostly young people so that they're able to benefit on that. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a combination of a whole set of different interventions mm -hmm. that we need to support SMME growth going forward. Whether you're in big business or small business, something that's going to affect you if it's not uh, kept in check and that does affect a lot of people is crime. Mm. Uh, and there's you know, so many iterations of it, uh, whether it's the cartel-like behavior that we see in the bigger industries, or whether it's the physical crime that small business owners, how is that going to be dealt with? Because if all the other challenges are sorted out and that's not, there's not really a point, right? Absolutely. I mean. They're the ones who are not insured, right? I mean, largely speaking, if one talks about informal economic activities, mm -hmm. or the small entrepreneur that just employs either himself, is self-employed, or have one or two people. These are businesses that don't have money for the kind of insurance that big firms have. You know, So if anything happens to them, they, they bear the cost immediately. It means between making money and destitution, right? And, and I think these are going to be important parts of it. 
we have now recently set up a collaborative effort with business to try and deal with um, um, a, a number of aspects, uh, energy, uh, logistics, freight logistics in particular, and crime and corruption and trying to tackle that, right? And from that point of view, I think there's, um, there's a significant amount of collaboration that is required, um, community involvement that is required, the ability to be able to report crime, the ability not to participate in corrupt activities, to be able to report this, capacity in the state to prosecute, the capacity of getting more boots on the ground, uh, detectives, forensic services, and these are all important parts of a value chain that I think is going to be quite critical. I'm quite pleased to say, I mean, the, the collaboration with, the, with business around this is going to look at where the business can support and collaborate on some of those areas. <clears throat> I'm also quite happy to say that um, um, I understand that the business colleagues are going to relaunch Business Against Crime. Business Against Crime played such an important, uh, such an important role a few years ago. And of course, it's, um, it's lost its way, or perhaps it hasn't focused uh, sufficiently enough, or haven't had enough resources. And so I think relaunching Business Against Crime is an important area. It's a kind of ability that we mobilize a whole of society. We need to get communities involved. We need to get unions involved. We need to get business people involved, all involved in trying to address fundamentally some of these challenges, mm -hmm. which, is, which impacts on small business the most. You know? And that's, that's going to be an important collaboration, and I'm really looking forward to it. Mm. Do you think the way information gets out really affects our perceptions? Because you're either generally someone who's like, oh, you know, South Africa is such a fantastic country. We've got so much potential. We have, you know, best rugby team in the world. Uh, so much, so much goodness in our country. And then because of these challenges you and I have spoken about, you also get people who are quite sour yeah. about uh, the state of the country. It is. I mean, you know, I, I, I can't understand the negative. The, I mean, of course, we, we got a noisy, we refer to it as a noisy democracy, right? Yeah. Which is quite important. Uh, and uh, that democracy is about people on social media, people in the news, people publicly criticizing and rightly so yeah. expressing their rights. But I think we don't do enough to communicate the good messages, yeah. right? And the good messages to South Africans, the good messages, firstly, the good messages to South African and citizens, right? Because they face significant challenges. And so good news stories are always important to be able to read. Not just good news stories for the sake of it, but good news stories to see that we are, you know, making progress. It's not just about government progress. It's about whether we as a society have been able to, um, you know, take, it, take the bull by its horns, in, in, so to speak, in terms of the challenges we face. Then, of course, good news stories to the rest of the world because it's important for us to get investment, for people to come here as tourists, for people to invest in uh, machinery and, uh, you know, building factories and stuff like that. And so there are lots of good news stories that we need to do. And I think we need to develop a common narrative as South Africans. You know, it doesn't help us if we have different narratives around what is good and what is bad. I think it's important to accept that there's lots of challenges, right? Yeah. But we also can overcome those challenges. We've shown how we can overcome those challenges. Just a few years ago, we faced one of the most severe pandemics. We worked collectively together. We were able to transcend our differences. We were able to allocate resources. We were able to do a lot of interventions to support our response to COVID. And that is fundamental. Why can't we build on those kind of relationships mm -hmm. and that kind of partnership? This collaboration that we're having with business builds on that. It's a similar kind of cooperation where business has come to us and said, how can we assist you government? Ask us, right? Mm -hmm. And that's quite critical when someone says, we can, we can assist. We're not trying to take over government. We're not trying to tell you what to do, but we have resources, we have skilled people. Can we provide those skilled skill people or resources to assist you in overcoming your challenges? And I think that's a really good start, building on where we were two years ago, three years ago, when we were, we were facing a dire situation with COVID-19. And tell me about that collaboration practically. Uh, you're taking the skill set that's in the private sector, that's also in the private sec uh, in the public sector as well, mm -hmm. and trying to make sure that you work towards a South Africa, a common goal, a South Africa that we want. How are you going to know that this has worked properly and when? Yes, difficult, but <laughs> I think the nicest part about it is that we, we're not discussing policy. We're not discussing okay. the economy. We, we identify a problem. <clears throat> so let me uh, use a good example. Our collaboration 
now, for example, in the energy space is using that skills and expertise. So anybody that worked in the energy space over many years have all worked for ESCOP at some point or another, mm -hmm. right? So we are collaborating on identifying specific power stations that have been problematic and that have not churned out the power that is required. The business guys have said to us, can we help you? Can we send the right expertise there? Can we perhaps mentor and assist the power station managers or the young teams at these power stations, if they are? Um, what specifically of the technical work do you require us to do? So now we're collaborating on something that's tangible, right? It's not about politics, it's not about policy. It's about fixing a power station and then bringing in resources. And I think that's the kind of collaboration that's there. It's not telling us how to run government. It's not telling us how to run ESCOM. But it's saying, you've got a problem at this power station. Can we come in there to help you mm -hmm. to be able to, to assist with that? And similarly, we're doing something on logistics because, you know, um, again, there are many people that have worked in the logistics space, freight logistics and port space, that had worked for Transnet over many, many years. And so they've left, they've either set up their own firms or working for you know, other multinationals. And they too have offered and said, can we help you with some of the corridors? You know, um, we have experts that know how to run or how to assist in dealing with problems specifically for the coal corridor or the iron ore corridor, for example, mm -hmm. or the general freight or the ports, for example, at Riches Bay Coal Terminal or Durban um, uh, Container Terminal. So there are, there are these practical things. And I think the point here is that it's a genuine collaborative effort on problem solving and fixing something. And I think that's what makes a difference from when we had other forms of social compacting that talks about a lot of you know, broader kind of um, interventions but doesn't get into the specifics. And I think this is why I'm so confident that we, we can work together and we can uh, fix um, you know, specific problems we, which I think are going to be important for our growth story and for getting growth right. I think it's really good to get an insight into what's being done, uh, the challenges that you've identified that a lot of people are also saying are challenges and then dealing with it. But practically, how is that going to work? How is that relief and those efforts are going to play out in our day-to-day -day lives as people living in South Africa? No, absolutely. And I mean, many people will also, okay, this is good for business, this is good for big business. But what does it mean for ordinary men in the street, for ordinary workers, for ordinary community members? Ordinary us. Yeah. Ordinary us, yes, absolutely. <laughs> and I think it's important. So I would say, look at it in two ways. The first is that if we do the reform right and we get the kind of growth of 5% that you refer to, that would mean we'll see significant investment. That would mean we'll see significant uh, growth in employment, hopefully. And that in itself has a cascading effect through the economy. So more people are employed, more people are able to earn income, more individuals who are unemployed in households are able to you know, contribute to the households. But again, um, I, I think many people are going to say, when is that going to happen, right? So I think it's quite critical that as from a government point of view, where I sit, we're going to have to think about what are the short-term measures that are going to be important. So those short-term measures we have to continue with public employment programs, for instance the presidential employment stimulus, or interventions to support young people, for example. Um, these are going to be crit quite critical. Um, even the continuation of some form of household income support that we currently have. These are important short-term measures while the economy recovers, while we get the kind of growth, while we get jobs that are going to be created. Government cannot ignore that, and I think it's going to be quite important for us to have that two-pronged approach. You know what? Not one before the other. You know, one doesn't come before the other. We have to do it jointly. We have to do it together. Structural reform together with short-term interventions to support households and people. Okay. If I had to ask you in 30 seconds to explain how the interventions that are being made between government and business are going to play out in our lives in South Africa and the advantages of that, what would you say? Um, I think it would play a positive. It's the first time we have a collaboration at that level. I think what we need to do is make sure that those um, collaboration and benefits are cascaded as quickly as possible in the economy and in society. Rudy Dix from the presidency, just giving us insight into the plans for economic growth, trying to reach that target of 5% set by the National Development Plan that will really ensure that so much gets moving in the South African economy 
and takes us to the South Africa that we want to see. One of the challenges to achieving that though, as we've heard, crime and corruption. So next week we're going to focus on that. Just stay with us.